Kendrick Lamar, GNX. That is why he's the GOAT. That was a moment from our first live album reaction to Kendrick Lamar's new album, GNX. If you guys want to catch the entire uncut album reaction that we did with the Patreon family, you guys could do so by joining the Patreon. All you got to do is hit the link in the pinned comments or in our description. Yes, but sir. at new Kendrick Lamar album, what a time it is to be covering music and especially considering what we're coming off of, of the entire Drake and Kendrick battle. We get an album so soon. Let's get into the artist's performance, bro. What did you make of it? Well, listen, this one was, like, it's an interesting one, and I'll explain to you why. Um, going into this album, you and I had expectations, right? And usually our expectations are never met, especially with artists like Kendrick because they always reinvent themselves, right? And they'll never really give you what the fans want, but they'll give you what you need, right? And that's going to be a new aesthetic that no one's able to call, new sounds, whatever the case may be, a new approach to the music. With this one, we knew. We knew what was going to happen, and it couldn't have gone any other way, and I'll explain to you why. Especially with the aggressive tone that you're going to get on this album. Um, especially that he's taking this victory lap approach. Did you expect anything different? Especially when you listen to something like a Whacked Out Murals, or even something like a Squabble Up, which was previewed, um, I believe, right after the whole um, pop-out show. Right? Well, yeah, and, well, well, Squabble Up was previewed at the beginning of Not Like Us, of that video. So, yeah, within that week. Um, something like even a TV off, he's coming to you with these really aggressive and these really violent cadences, and it just proves that, you know, he's in a certain type of zone right now, especially after a battle. You and I were even speaking about, let's say, Nas is still mad at coming after the Jay-Z battle, and that album felt aggressive, it felt in your face, and I feel like there's sort of a similar energy within this track list, and what's interesting is that you're going to get new flows, even on something like a Whacked Out Murals, where, you know, he's a bit more patient with it, he'll leave spaces between his lines, and he'll make you really feel every single bar that, you know, he's laying down on this track list. Not only that, but I feel like from a performance standpoint, um, it's one of maybe his most direct approaches in comparison to previous albums um, with the Pippa Butterfly and even with something like a Mr. Morale. Um, you go through some of the flows and cadences and they're a bit quirkier. Um, some of them feel a, a bit more complicated with this. It's a very direct performance, at least, my, at least in my opinion. You're definitely getting quirky performances, though. Um, I want to start talking about Whacked Out Murals because... That was such an interesting intro as you have Kendrick coming at you with this calm but menacing cadence throughout the track. And what was really interesting about that is that you could tell that he wanted you to feel all of his wrath with that song. And you hear it through, like, again, just his delivery, bro. The way that it sounds like he's clenching his teeth as he delivers every word. The way that it feels like, you know, if you were watching him record this song in the studio, he was probably mean mugging his engineer the whole time. Like, you really feel his fury and he delivers that through these amazing tone switches and flow switches that are super dynamic and um, that's one of those songs where he is in war mode going back to squabble up which you were talking about that was a major highlight for me one of the biggest if not the biggest banger on the entire album and um, it was interesting to hear his delivery on the hook I feel good get the fuck out my face like that was sort of a baby keemism where you're hearing the quirkiness that maybe rubbed off him rubbed off on him since he started working with baby keem like you're gonna see across other tracks on this album as well and speaking of that song I love even the opening hyperventilation from Kendrick that was really dope and it's just one of the hardest opening sections of any Kendrick song ever to me and even the manic screams brought so much life to that track it felt very Yeezus and Kanye like and something else I want to ask you too is that like mm -hmm. I got the impression that you know, he was making some of these songs probably around the same time of the battle. Because if you go to, let's say, the bridge on Squabble Up, um, you'll hear him on the bridge saying, Hold up, where are you from? Which is the same flow as, the are you home. my friend? Are we locked in? Which is also a bridge on Not Like Us. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like Not Like Us and that whole sort of era and those sessions that came out of the battle maybe bled in or inspired some of these tracks performance wise well you got it spot on with that one but even something like tv off that sounds like a not like us type track and you could see with the aggressive demeanor and coming in with it and what i like about tv off as well is that he delivers the new mustard tag that's going viral right now and um even like there's a similar difference to like that a minor moment within not like us yes. within this one um which, with, with, with the mustard line yeah with the mustard one so i, I think that it was cool I think that, um, you know, he couldn't go any other way with this one. You have Not Like Us that's ringing off so close to this one. And people maybe have complaints about it, but at the same time, it's like, this is a new sound that he previewed. 
he realistically dropped one song like this this year. It was one of the biggest songs of the year. And we knew that maybe that was going to be an intro for a studio album. So that's definitely prominent. Then you're getting more relaxed and patient flows as well. Um, that kind of not steer away from like the West Coast type of Bay Area sound or flows that you're listening to. But something that feels a bit closer um, for Kendrick's demeanor. So example, something like Man at the Garden. This one was interesting because um, not only is he more patient with his flows, it's more relaxed. Um, it feels like he's in more of a, a state of peace at this point and he's kind of moved on past it but you know he also says the i deserve it all type of thing and i like that type of flow where he's going from one line to another um the i deserve it all cadence as well as patient he seems calm and he seems like he's in a state of relaxation but let's talk about some melodic performances um that i'm not necessarily mad at but certain ones that i find a you know a bit less interesting at least for my rotation so example um something like dodger blue I, it's a performance that's a bit more monotone. Um, it's a bit sleepier. It's not necessarily something I'm buying into as far as the track list goes. I know that's maybe a gripe that you have with this performance. Um, did you like those types of songs, even something like a Luther, for example? You know what? I liked his performance on Luther, even though there were like, you know, maybe little aspects of it that I feel like were needed. Um, like the whole like drop it like it's hot mini interpolation. That was okay. That didn't really do much for me. Um, you're getting more baby Keemisms with like the fa 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 fa, which Keem uses on Hooligan. So um, it felt like Baby Keem was all was almost on this album in spirit, even though he wasn't featured. But um, apart from that, looking at Dodger Blue, like you said, super sleepy melodic performance, very boring melodies. Um, I think that's easily his worst performance on the entire album for me personally um but that being said going back to man of the garden like you were talking about i love the way that he interpolated naz's flow from one mic on yeah. that song and even to the point where it's like on one mic there's a point where like there's this pent-up aggression that explodes onto the mic from Nas. There's the same sort of like structural change and tone change that happens with Kendrick on that song. So really cool way of paying homage. And speaking of paying homage, we have to speak about Reincarnated, which is easily one of Kendrick's best performances on this entire album. Super aggressive, and it's raw. Yeah, yeah, the way that he was really you know, able to capture Tupac's voice and flow was a beautiful thing to witness, especially after, you know... A lot of people took Taylor Made as being this mockery of Tupac. It felt like he sort of settled the score and gave people something um, really memorable when it came to paying homage to a legend. And even just the storytelling technique from the last verse, that reminds We're you of like get, yeah. DMX's Damien. But yeah, we'll get into that for the content. But you know, there's also something else that I like within the performance of Reincarnated. Um, it goes into that third verse and the vocal switches, like the way that he used the vocal effects to um, kind of take the perspective of God and the way that he was having that conversation. That was super well done. Yeah. Um, it felt like they were two completely separate entities. And I've always enjoyed that from Kendrick Lamar. Um, but let's talk about something like... I don't know, even like what about, hey, wait, now, what, what, yeah, yeah, go go, no, hey now you're gonna say I was gonna talk about hey okay. now and even um something like peekaboo where like maybe um they're those are the quirkier performances for me within the track list. So did you like them? Do you think that they were well executed upon from like let's say a flow and rhythm standpoint? Do you think that it matched the production? Like how do you feel about these new types of performances from Kendrick? Yeah, no, hey now was a, a killer performance, bro. Just high energy, new flows. Absolutely love that one. When it came to peekaboo. I mean, yeah, it's back to Kendrick being a bit more in his silly bag, and it was cool. I didn't love the hook too much, and it's funny because um, there's a part where he's like, hey, 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 that's my bitch, and that sounds something out of, I'm not even joking when I say this, something out of You Know Miles' rhyme book. Again, if you've listened to You <laughs> yeah, Know Miles, uh, I kid you not, the, the fucking goat. bro, You Know Miles <laughs> has influenced the goat. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I really doubt that Kendrick was influenced by that, but it's so funny how similar um just that like the that genius the genius that rhythm of miles but yeah you know it, because that's so unconventional and it's so off beat and so off rhythm that i'm like i, I get it, it. it you really hear the similarity yeah i get it um but yeah man i mean listen there's there's no doubt that kendrick definitely wore his influences on his sleeve when it came to his performances across this album interpolating nas um Inter trying yeah. to sound like tupac even um, you know, using flows and rhythms that make us think back to, um, you know, some Bay Area legends like a Cool Keith, like a Mac Dre, um, even being influenced, like I said, by Baby Keem or even Drake with a Ruler in some performances. I feel like ultimately he was super raw. He sounded as unhinged as ever. And he was just as exuberant as you'd expect him to be on the celebratory album, on this Victory Lap album. So 
it, it was um it was excellent bro it really was yes amazing rating amazing rating for the artist performance without a doubt but content matter yeah man and this is interesting because it's the first kendrick lamar album in his whole discography that doesn't have this elaborate concept you know it's really rather an ode to the music and culture of california and more than anything he's also continuing the crash out bro like this is an ego boost it's him talking his shit on a yeah. large portion of this album but that being said you get these mind-blowing song concepts woven throughout it kind of spread throughout it as he pleases okay so there's different perspectives for me on this album you have that like you have the wartime kendrick taking the victory lap and talking about how he feels like he is truly on top of the game and then you have the woven in song concepts um that you get into and it's like Wow, these are super well-written songs and some of the best-written songs of the year. So where do you want to start? You want to start with the song concepts? Do you want to start in with like the wartime material? Where do you want to go? Well, let's start off with the wartime material since it comes off early on the track list. So oh, Whacked I mean, Out Murals, that was yeah. a big song, right? And that it's, caused a lot of headlines. So you want to go into them? You want to go into the Lil Wayne bars? So Yeah, let's go into all the bars. I mean, I think this song is interesting because he's kind of rapping about like all the different events that went down this year and, um, you know, just venting his frustration. But yeah, talking about the Wayne bar, you want to read it out? Yeah, I used to bump the Carter 3. I held my rolly chain proud. Irony, I think my hard work let Lil Wayne down. And this was a big topic of conversation. As soon as the album came out, we put out that tweet and um, it went absolutely viral because there was a big conversation of Lil Wayne and how he was supposed to be the star performer and the headliner at the Super Bowl. And, you know, Wayne went into interviews and he's talked about how he felt disappointed that he wasn't chosen for it. And that put a lot of pressure on Kendrick Lamar and how people felt like, did you kind of steal the Super Bowl? And then when we got into the whole context of it, we were like, okay, maybe if you do like a young money, cash money sort of thing where it's in New Orleans and you make this whole grandiose event out of it, then maybe it's needed. But at the same time, like, Kendrick is truly the MVP of this year, and that's what they usually do. He's had the hottest records of the year. There's going to be material that's going to ring off within that Super Bowl performance, and it was the right decision, in my opinion. To quote, Craig, to quote Kendrick, I deserve it all. He deserved that Super Bowl, and I think it's interesting because Wayne obviously expressed his, expressed his disappointment for not being chosen, and then on this song, I don't view it as like, Kendrick trying to bait Wayne or get him involved in a battle or being hateful towards him. I think in return, he's expressing his own disappointment in Wayne's reaction, how he's not giving him his flowers and saluting him for what he's been doing for hip hop and the greatness that he's achieved. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is that obviously this generated a response from Wayne where he pretty much said, you know, why he say fuck me for. Um, but it wasn't a fuck you, at least in my opinion. People could interpolate it differently and, you know, sorry, interpret interpret it differently or have a conversation around it. But in my opinion, like you said, it was more coming out of a place of disappointment where it's like Kendrick has often cited Lil Wayne as one of his biggest influences and, as you know, a goat and, you know, one of his uh, biggest mentors as well. And at the same time, it's like, well, fuck, maybe there's a bit of a disappointment there. Same thing with the Snoop Dogg line. So at the same time, like kind of everyone was catching some sort of stray or at least like some sort of thought from Kendrick where he had this to say about Snoop. He said, Snoop posted Taylor made. I prayed it was the apples. I couldn't believe it. It was only right for me to let it go. So we know um, how high of a regard that Kendrick, you know, put Snoop Dogg on, um, called him a top five rapper of all time. You know, the passing of the torch. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many different ties that come in with Kendrick Lamar and Snoop Dogg. And within this situation, it's like, well, no, it wasn't only Wayne, but like Snoop Dogg had some, you know, sort of, you know, sorry, Kendrick had words for Snoop Dogg. So. And, and yeah, I think for Snoop Dogg, it's just like, again, it comes down to disappointment. I think Kendrick was disappointed in what appeared to be Snoop's neutrality throughout the battle or at least throughout that moment itself. But yes, yeah, going back to Wayne, it was interesting because in that tweet he put out, he pretty much said, you know, if you take it there, I'm going to take it further in the sense of sending out a warning shot to Ke to Kendrick. So um, we'll see what how that situation ends up shaping up. But um, what was interesting, too, about um, Whacked Out Murals is that Kendrick essentially said that, you know, this is going to be a lifetime conflict. You know, he's not into the idea of having any truces. He's not into the idea of patching anything up. And, um, you know, he'd rather take him to hell with him before um, going back on anything that he said. And um, it's also fuck anyone that empathizes with Drake's side. Um, but let's go on to squabble up just because um, obviously this is Kendrick celebrating the win after having squabbled up with Drake. And I don't know if everyone caught this because I didn't really see too many people, you know, talking about this or putting up any tweets or whatever the case may be. But 
there are some savage subliminal dissets towards Drake if you read into it the right way and you don't have to overthink it, but a line like, bitch with him and some bitch in him, that's a lot of bitch, don't hit him, he got kids with him. My apologies. I don't know if people caught on to that one, but that was pretty savage from Kendrick. Even another reference to the battle with the whole money tree's motive was towards verse 2 where he said, fallen from my money tree and it grow throughout the month. So mm -hmm. uh, paying, you know, obviously um, attention to what, you know, Drake had said about the money trees and not planting enough for his own community. Um, there was obviously reference there. Yeah. Um, it's just, you're right. Like this was one where you, you couldn't ignore it and there was full of subliminals, you know, so. So many. Um, let's talk about Man of the Garden because you kind of have the setup of Kendrick being alone on this remote island. It feels like he's having this inner monologue with himself where he's reminiscing over his life, his career accomplishments and how he deserves all the praises and all the prizes. And um, it's an interesting approach because, you know, you go from a song like you where he's thinking about like, do I really deserve to be here? Like I have all this survivor's guilt and like, you know, why me to a certain extent? And now you have this evolution of the mindset where yeah. he's realized like, no, like I I'm proud to have been able to do what I did. And then there's also a deeper meaning. I don't know if you caught on to this, but mm -hmm. um, some people are looking at this as him being sort of like at heaven's gates and giving sort of like his testimony as to why he maybe deserves to be immortalized in music and maybe go to like I heaven in a certain I, sense. I, I'm not sure. I'm a huge Kendrick Lamar fan, but I don't know if it goes that deep. I okay. think like he was taking the approach um, from a different perspective from which he did on with Mr. Marl and the Big Steppers. Mr. Marl and the Big Steppers, you go to a song like Savior and he kind of says like, I'm not your savior. I'm not your hero. Yep. Almost as if like he feels guilty for being on the pedestal that he's on. But with Man at the Garden, he's kind of relishing it and all. He's like, you know what? No, I do deserve this. And I love, like you said, the world building within this because um, you have, you know, some cool lines here where it's like the respect and the accolades lamping on the island watching Castaway. I like the little cultural reference there. But he does such a good job on the song at world building within the lyrics. But something else that I noticed about it. That you look at the structure of these lines. Yes. They're super short, they're super simplistic, but yet it's arguably one of the best written songs on this album. So I find that interesting because you go back to, let's say, previous albums, and this goes back to the simplistic approach with the writing um, for GNX. And it's like, he, you know, there's not going to be all these crazy tie ins from line to line, at least like from what I'm viewing at this point in time for this review. But he gets his message across so well, um, as far as like the writing goes on this album, and he doesn't necessarily have to overcomplicate it. These are raw thoughts. It feels like something that, um, he really enjoyed making and that, you know, he's happy with where he's at in his life, that it's peaceful for him. Um, but. Now let's keep going on with this. Reincarnated. I really wanted to talk about this song concept because it's one of the best as far as the albums go. Um, as far as the album goes, excuse me. And the perspective switches, the conversation with God. Like, what do you like the best as far as the writing goes, you know? Man. Because there's different approaches with it. I mean, yeah, we've seen Kendrick do this so many times. Looking back most recently, I like the hard part five. We're going all the way back to sing about me, I'm dying of thirst. And so many songs in his catalog. And I just love how well he's always able to bring the struggles of others to life in such a nuanced way and in a way that feels tasteful. He's always been able to capture like just what appears to be some of the tough emotions and hardships that these other people have, have gone through throughout history. And, um, you know, he's even done it on something like The Prayer, you could argue, which is an unreleased uh, gem from his catalog. And this song, in terms of just sound and feeling, reminded me of that a lot. And I think ultimately, yeah, it was just the beauty of him having that conversation with God and the way that it tied into a place where it's like, you know, I'm learning from the mistakes of these previous great musicians and I am trying to use my music to bring understanding and to inspire people and to cause them, you know, to live in harmony rather than like manipulating them for any evil reason. So it's just, it's a master class in songwriting. Obviously, there is debate about like, oh, well, which artist is he talking about? Is it Billie Holiday? Is it Dina Washington? Or even for the first one, is it really John Lee Hooker? Regardless of, you know, the exact people, it's just the way that he was able to break it down and tie it all together. And I love the fact that there's the idea of like Kendrick himself, the artist, being reincarnated and, you know, having so many similarities to these previous great artists, but also the idea of him bringing Tupac back to life on the song as well. 
um, just through the performance. So and it's 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 just because you also see like where his inspirations are at and like what really makes him as an artist. And what's cool is that you know as you could say, there's so many different interpolations and I keep saying that interpretations. Excuse me, interpretation of, yeah. of who he's referencing as far as you know um, who, who which artist yeah, yeah which artist is he bringing to the forefront? But it's almost like. He's almost saying that he, you know, shares the same struggles that they did at one point in time, and like they're artists from different eras and different genres of music, but it all relates back to him, and it all relates back to maybe the artist himself. And this was interesting when I was looking at the third verse, and this is just kind of like my own thoughts about it. This album is a big celebration, but there's almost like a humbling point within this third verse because God is kind of questioning Kendrick's actions and what he's doing. So, for example, um, but now. We hear now, centuries, you manipulated man with music. And it almost seems like, you know, sort of a growing point in how, like, the artist has evolved. And even at that, like, Kendrick's talking about how much he did well um, for Los Angeles and how um, he put so many different people on stage and, like, what he did. And God's like, yeah, but you're still not there yet. So it almost, like, it feels like it's coming from a place of, like, there's two sides to this emotion. And that was something that maybe we saw within the last single that he dropped before this album as well. Absolutely. Right? And um, I want to say this too, you know, if every song was written like Reincarnated or like some of the other ones we're about to get into, like A Glory or Heart Part 6, this would have had the potential to get a perfect rating for me, just have an absolute masterclass in songwriting from beginning to end. But that being said, when you look at the track list from TV off to Peekaboo, um, you do have a run of tracks where it is style over substance, without a doubt. And that's pretty rare. You know, to get, let's say, a three run of tracks on a Kendrick album where that's the case. And um, obviously, I'm not saying that there is no message or meaning whatsoever on a TV off, for example, or a Dodger Blue. But um, again, it's just it is that deliberate choice. It feels like to go with style over substance. But and how do you like, let's say, the repetition of, let's say, a peekaboo where even for um, the features on the album, he's still starting off their verses or I, I, should I say better their lines with the peekaboo? Um, word, you know? It's repetitive, you know, what they talking about, they ain't talking about nothing. I mean, I don't appreciate the song for the writing. It's just fun. He had his fun with it. You know what I mean? So that's just a song to, I guess, get hyped to in the whip. But let's talk about uh, the hard part six. We're actually, as it's been retitled, just hard part six, I guess, to not have any confusion with the Drake version that came out earlier this year. And this was a beautifully written song might be my favorite song on the album just because oh, that's interesting. Um, you're getting this origin story of his career. He's talking about his TD roots. He's showing gratitude to the people that molded him into the artist that he's become today. And what I love the most about it is that he's talking about that gradual evolution that he's had throughout his artistry and his career in the sense of like, you know, being this eager rapper who was you know just battling in his in his own hood to getting discovered by tde and being j-rock's hype man to actually becoming the star of tde to moving on from tde and from black hippie because he has these new creative concepts that he wants to tackle to the point where now his focus is to become an executive in the music industry and uplift others just that whole way that he tied his story all together was incredibly inspiring so um, I absolutely loved every every second of that song. Man. Well, it's also three long verses. This is one of the most dense um, songs lyrically as far as the album goes, and I really I really enjoy that. Um, even just talking about Punch and like the way that he kind of played it back to Phil Jackson, like um, the basketball references were incredible as well. Um, even looking at let's say um, the Ab Soul influence, talking about how at one point in time he used to study Ab Soul and he really wanted to be as good if not better as a writer than Absol and it almost feels like he took himself off the pedestal when it comes to the top dog entertainment stuff right and he was like at one point in time like I was a nobody within this company and like you know we kind of grew up together and we kind of brought this to a whole different point all together whether it was schoolboy Q Absol um you know me starting off with J-Rock and the origin story there, um, even talking about Dave Free and how Dave Free wore so many different hats um, as someone that was so close to Kendrick, whether he was doing his visuals, whether he was someone that, that was doing his producing, like, I love the origin story. And it was so detailed. It was so well written. And let's see what comes out of it, right? Because PG Lang is on the rise. Um, this was an album that was released underneath PG Lang, the second one, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to Kendrick's catalog. Because Mr. Morale... No, sorry. Mr. Morale was the first one... Was the last one under Top Dog Entertainment. My bad. Well, but it, it was still... It was like... Um Devised between Top Dog and PG Lang, like technically it was his first PG Lang. But I'm just release. saying, is like this is his first like standalone 
album yes. within the PG line catalog. Yes. So um, I just I think it's a great victory lap, and it's just like him reminiscing over everything. Like this one was really tasteful. absolutely. I think the last one that I personally do want to speak about was Gloria on this track list. Yeah, um, so well so. written. He's you know when you go through that song in the first listen, initially you do believe that he's speaking to Whitney just because. He's speaking about, you know, being with this woman for so long. And obviously they have a history of being high school sweethearts. But And he's also talking about like the chemistry between them and like um, the nuances they have together. But, but as you reach, you know, the plot yeah. twist of the song, you realize as you're going further and further into these verses that it's actually a big metaphor of him writing this love letter to his pen. And I love all the double meanings for how poetic they are. Like, for example, looking at lyrics like she said one day I would write my wrongs and see paper. So, of course, like, see paper, like, see money, but also see paper because the pen is going to see paper. Um, also, another one, fabrication, I disgust you. Then you blocked me, I said, fuck you. I don't know if everyone caught on to this, but fabrication, I disgust you in the sense of, like, maybe he was capping in some of his lyrics. Maybe he wasn't being truthful with the pen, and then you blocked me. But Get, also, let me finish that. Yeah. Then you blocked me, getting writer's block. Crazy. The same way that a woman could block you. Then, then he also says, and then I said, fuck you. And he got writer's block between Dam and Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. That's why you got a five-year break. And he said, fuck you to the pen, again, metaphorically. So super well written. Well, not only that, but he also goes back to, to Pimp a Butterfly and talks about the writing process there and kind of like plays on that fine line of like, okay, is he talking about Whitney or is he talking about his pen? To tell the truth, I've been pretty used to what open-minded people do in 2014, I went to Africa, baby. You was my passenger. So it's like the pen, the passenger. Of course. Was it Whitney? So th that's it. Like the writing is so like split through the middle to where like it's hard to make that difference. But at the same time, it's like it's easy to make out that he's talking about both of them. And I really love that as far as a song concept goes because maybe he's even talking about like both of these things are as important in my life. My creative expression as well as my love for my family and what I have going on and they go hand in hand together and I find that such an interesting song concept. And something else that I want to say about, you know, what makes Kendrick Lamar an all-time great and why he's so important to this generation and this culture is that he keeps showing us that he is a student of the game and that he is reminding us of the greats that have come before him, even looking at this song concept, look at Biggie, you know, with me and my bitch or look at Common with I used to love her. You know what I mean? It's like it's these song concepts that are just even the personification of just an item like a Nas, I gave you power. Like that's a bit different as far as a song concept goes. But the writing style is almost the same. And you hear the influence, even something um, like the first line on verse three, you were spontaneous firecracker. Plus, our love is dangerous. Life of passion. Laugh at you. Uh, laugh at you. Lose your temper. Slightly crash. And like, he's kind of describing his temper with the pen, but also maybe the temper that Whitney has with him and how it's kind of con like it's hard to control both those things within his life. So it's crazy. another one. Remember when you caught that body and still wiggled through that sentence? Um, so sentence like prison sentence, but also wiggling the pen through the sentence. Like um, it's just it's so masterfully done. And. Ultimately, I want to give um, the content an amazing rating. As I said, um, it had the potential to be perfect, but you do have a run of songs where, again, fair play. He wanted to just be a bit more direct and straightforward and just have these fun, you know, hard-hitting bangers that don't have the most substance. And that's okay because it's Kendrick Lamar and he doesn't often stray away from having these super deep, intricate messages. So if he wants to do it a couple of times on the album, that's cool, bro. That's what it is, and um, at least it was like it was done tastefully, and it, like it kind of played into the album itself. Like for may sure, maybe artists at a certain point like they want to be more playful with their song concepts, but like that's all they do, or you know they're completely left field for the tracklist. But with this, it didn't make sense for the vibe and for the approach of the album. But is there, let's speak it, about the features. features. So um, do you have a list of all the features? I do, and obviously the narrative when it came to the features on this album was that. Kendrick was putting on for LA, for the West Coast. He wanted to essentially, it felt like, introduce us to a bunch of rising LA artists that a lot of us have never heard of. And that's what he well, does. Well, at least from our part of North America, right? Because that's a thing too. Yeah, but I mean, I think, you know, to, again, a large portion of the hip-hop audience, a lot of people seem to be super unfamiliar with these artists. And obviously, these these guys have fans. There's people that rock with them. And there's someone like AZ Chike, for example, who was featured on Blue Lips earlier this year. So um, it was very interesting to see him 
you know, make that play. And essentially, we have 12 features on the track list. You have SZA, you have Roddy Rich, you have AZ Chike, you have Dodi Six, Hitta J3, Peso, Siete seven times, Wally the Sensei, Young Threat, Data Barrera, who was the mariachi um, band singer who performed at the Dodger Stadium, and then Kendrick found her and brought her onto the album. Um, we'll get into you know her contribution soon. You had Sam Du, uh, who was on Mr. Moral and the Big Steppers, and then Inc., who also provided vocals, excuse me. Um, let's start off talking about Deira Barrera, just because she has three different contributions. She's the first voice that we hear on the album as she's featured on Whacked Out Murals, Reincarnated, and Gloria. And what's cool is that there's one poem that she is singing that follows across all three of these tracks and what's interesting about the way that they're split up is that they all play into each of the song concepts so if you do the translation for whacked out murals it basically says i feel your presence here last night and we start to cry and then after that she has the post chorus and this one translates to that reflects in your gaze the night you and me and it's so interesting because like there's this ominous vibe throughout the project right and this kind of feels like the cinematic entrance to it this yes. is legitimately the first words that you hear onto the album and this entire album kind of feels like Kendrick talking to himself right and Kendrick kind of taking this victory lap and this is sort of like after the war, you know, like looking into the sunset, you know, gazing and looking at what type of destruction you left, but also like what comes after the destruction, you know, what type of things do you want to do after this? And I feel like her contributions were super important to this album. Incredible. One of, if not my favorite featured artist on this album, just because her voice is so powerful and like there's this theatrical and cinematic, like you said, sadness to the vocals as well. Um, that really just is super compelling and super unique, bro, to, to bring in a mariachi singer into a hip-hop album like and make her fit in so well. Like, imagine they take, you know, her vocals for maybe the start of a music video for Whack Down Murals and, like, you get Kendrick, like, looking over, let's say, on the city of Los Angeles or maybe in a desert and kind of, like, walking on this path alone. It feels like... There's been destruction, but now it's time to breathe new creation and maybe a new approach artistically um, for him. And like you said, she was arguably um, the best performer on this album besides Kendrick Lamar. Absolutely. Wait, you want to go into SZA? Let's go into SZA, who had a phenomenal guest verse on Luther. Um, sounding... I feel like th yeah, I feel like this should have been a SZA song, though, low-key. I like no, just because, like, that's bro, my I, I disagree because the way that their voices collide on that chorus... That is exceptional. But imagine, bro. but I'm okay. I'm just gonna tell you this. Imagine on Luther, like you had like those SZA vocals, or maybe you had a bit more of like a performance. From I her. disagree, just because uh, both of their voices in that song, they both brought in these soft textures, and again, the chemistry was a one. But obviously, she stole the show in that song. Her vocals sounded as divine That's as usual. It. Like I'd really like that production for her. You know, I yes. felt like that would have been a good song, maybe for a new album or. Whatever the case the may be. The chemistry was on point. Though, it on was, Luther, though. It was, sure. but at the same time. Um, all right. Let's speak about Dodie Six, who appears on Hey Now. Um, kind of has this monotone cadence. Isn't really spitting bars like that. And this is what I want to say about... Um, we'll speak about some individual features and single them out. But when it comes to a lot of the LA natives who showed up on this track list, I respect it in terms of Kendrick putting on for these artists. I think it's a beautiful way to uplift LA, which has been one of his missions throughout this entire year. That being said, um, I can't really say that there was a feature that stood out to me as memorable or stood out to me as like, wow, the bars on here or the performance was crazy. Like, I really wasn't blown away by by any of the of the LA features to be totally honest with you. The only one that felt like really memorable to me at least and like the one that I've been going back to um the most was probably Dodie 6. Um and okay. I'll explain to you why because um comes in with like this subdue monotone but yet menacing um cadence the flows on point and all the rhythms that they're using are all inspired by the bay area sound in los angeles and um i really like that at least for the track list but like you said um this felt like more of like let's put on for our city more than let's choose some of the best and maybe you know some of the best verses that we could possibly get for this because you go through it and i believe it was towards the end of gnx even some like a verse like young threats when it comes to verse three like it feels more of like a spoken word more than anything you know which is not bad whatsoever but i mean you're not getting the best let's say you know possible feature list that you can with this album well that's what it is it's like if you want to like gnx right that was a song where he kind of just passed them the baton for that entirety of the track, right? He took a back seat on it and made them shine. And to be honest with you, it's like, 
again, respect the move. It's just it's not the most talented crop of MCs that you could put on an album or rappers for that point. To be honest with you, like bars aside, I just I wasn't captivated or moved by the performances the way that I was maybe hoping to be. Um, Az Trike on Peekaboo did a, a decent job. Keeps up with Kendrick, who's rapping really casually. There wasn't that much effort that had to be put in. Um, another song that had a lot of features on this track list was Dodger Blue, where you're getting Wally the Sensei, Roddy Rich, and Siete on the chorus duty, and it didn't feel like you needed them all there. It kind of felt like it was a bit too busy as a chorus, and you could have just used Roddy Rich, who sounded the smoothest out of all of them on that chorus, and then Sam Do and Inc. Um, did a great job on the outro together. That was a good collaboration on that song. Um, but ultimately, then you also have, let's, let's speak about SZA, who's in the chorus of Gloria, who has these breathtaking, high-pitched harmonies um, on that song. And I just love her commitment to the song concept, too, how she's singing like she's that pen on the interlude. Um, and even on Genius. the outro, yeah, she closes off the album as well because she has the outro um, on Gloria. As far as what I think, um, when it comes to the overall feature list, um, it was well-curated. Um, I think that it was well curated for the vibe of the album, but yet, like, maybe you could argue that there's a mismatch in talent when it comes to SZA or Kendrick um, with the rappers that were featured on this. Like, I would have loved to see a Schoolboy Q on this or an app. I know. So, you know, but that's just me and that's my personal preferences. Um, I think overall they did a great job, but I think the feature list was just good. It was good. I think, obviously, SZA and um, Data Barrera absolutely killed it. But when you look at the other features that were on the album, they were passable, they fit for the tracks, but they didn't always feel totally necessary um so within it yeah but it's okay. gonna get a good rating let's talk about the production and this album is produced primarily by soundwave who's always been in kendrick's corner for countless albums essentially all of his albums you have jack antonoff who stepped up and took a big role in this album as well um which doesn't come as a big surprise after he did contribute um you know to 616 in LA and we saw appearances of course from Mustard which was something that I expected I think everyone predicted that his next album if it was going to be the Victory Lap album you would have you would have had be, yeah. Mustard all over it but not only that because that sound is so prominent and people are maybe having the complaint with it of like oh maybe it's a bit too simple or oh it just sounds like not like us but think about it why wouldn't you do that you introduced this um sound for yourself in the summer it was super successful um it was one of the biggest moments of 2024 like why not attack that lane and you also can't say that that's the only style that you're getting throughout this album there's all kinds of different productions and there's all kinds of different sounds that you're going to get out of it but and, and yeah, yeah speaking of that point of, of mustard i just want to say this i think you know he saw an opportunity after not like us and the types of beats that mustard was cooking where it's like I can make hit records and I can make commercial records while sticking off, like, while sticking with authenticity to my roots. And I don't have to like go with a trendy sound. I don't need to do something that's outside of, you know, what's expected out of me or that what, what might feel like too much of a leap. Like this is a West Coast driving production. And speaking about the overall soundscape. Yeah, it's very West Coast, bro. You're getting these up-tempo beats that have a lot of Cali bounce. You have these progressive hyphy beats from Mustard that are very contemporary. Um, you have a G-Funk inspired beat on Dodger Blue and incredible sampling throughout. So which song do you want to start off by highlighting, man? Man, there, there's so many that I want to start with. I guess we could start with all the West Coast production um, as far as this album goes, just because we were having the conversation. Something like a TV off. This beat is nuts, bro. This beat is absolutely mm -hmm. stupid. Um, especially when you get the horns from Mustard on that second part. It's anthemic. Great sample. It's in your, yeah, it's just, it's absolutely incredible as far as a beat goes. Not only that, I want to talk about Reincarnated. Um, you know, this was um, a sample flip of Tupac's song made, and this was just so well done, especially with how well it plays into the song concept. I want to say that as well is that Kendrick's always been so good at picking his beats because they always play into the writing or the vision of that record, and that's also prominent on something like Man at the Garden. You're getting these rain esque sounds in the background that puts you so well into the setting and that puts you into the driver's seat, and that's what I love about this soundscape is that practically every single beat was well done but there's a couple that i'm like okay yeah uh, like this is good but it's a bit simplistic or it's a bit one note you know we, we got to speak about g and x which i think is truly one of the worst beats kendrick has ever rapped on you listen to just the timing of the drums 
on that production and they're so horribly timed really offbeat um and it's just got like you know some eerie keys looped um not special whatsoever and I I do think that as of right now, that is a skip on this track list. Um, in terms of, yeah, like you were talking about, some of the West Coast sounding productions like a TV off. Um, sonically sounds like a Not Like Us 2.0 in terms of like the chords that are being used. But yeah, that, that modern like hyphy shit with just the thumping horns that were sampled. That was incredible. Sounds like victory music. Um, Man at the Garden is another one you wanted to talk about that I wanted to give my two cents on. I just love the way he created ambiance on this song yeah. and how he created that sense of solitude with those rainfall cinematic sounds and also with like those isolated and sparse guitar a uh, bass guitar plucks that come in it just it perfectly puts you in this meditative zone that kendrick's lyrics also take you um to so. but that what's cool about that song too is that you could imagine like him writing the song right and like which room he's in like maybe he has mm -hmm. his beautiful beach house on a remote island like he's just creating in a and, and like an area of isolation and i think that was perfectly done as far as that song goes even more of the menacing type of production and the darker type of production that you're going to get on a whacked out murals um this one's so interesting to me because you get like these um sort of brash and dark alarm sounds that come in and out and like that creates a sense of urgency for the vibe of the track and it feels like kendrick lamar is here and he's ready to play you know and that's what's so cool about that beat and also i love the difference in the drums on this song right because you know, you start off with like a bit more of like a, I would say a patient um, drum pattern and then boom, like you're halfway through the song and it starts to speed up and then you could see the flows are getting quicker and then you could see he's getting more and more aggressive with it. And I love that type of like dynamic energy for this track. And what's cool too about just the structure of that instrumental is like the twists and turns that you're getting Crazy. taken on in the sense of like you're hearing like these word time horns mixed in with these sinister synths and this bouncy bass line. But yet once Data Barrera comes back in the post chorus, then we hear some acoustic strings before going back to that ominous explosive production another massive highlight for me in terms of the instrumentals here is definitely the beat on squabble up which has these nostalgic bouncy synths and you know this 80s dance pop freestyle sample okay, of debbie yeah. debs when i hear music and yeah. then the fact that kendrick places that mid verse to me was just super unconventional and super clever and that was like a little easter egg for this song because everyone kind of thought based on the snippets that like that sample wasn't going to be there, but I really like how they decided to not include it because once you get to that sample, you're like, oh shit, there's an extra layer to it. Um, and this is one of the bounciest songs as far as the track list goes. Um, how did you like something like the Hard Part 6? This felt a bit more conventional for Kendrick. Um, it really feels like they wanted to have his vocals be the main centerpiece of this entire song. So how did you like that production? I absolutely loved it. You're getting a sample from SWV's Use Your Heart, who was an R&B trio from the 90s. And what's interesting is that the Neptunes produced it. So you're technically getting Kendrick rapping over some Pharrell production on this album. And it just brought you the perfect amount of soul that you needed for that song. So um, that was a great decision to have on there. Um, apart from that, Luther, um, beautifully produced. I love the somber acoustic strings on it. The Luther Vandross um, vocal sample and the violins that get added later on in the track. That was a blissful song to listen to. Didn't need the hard hitting 808s on it though. Like that, that's the one thing with Luther. I'm like, okay, the drums could have been a bit smoother. They could have been a bit more low key. But that's it. Um, ultimately, the production was great to me. It was it was exhilarating. It was thrilling. Um, like I said, there's a there's a couple of beats like a GNX where you know they aren't totally well produced, but from the sampling selection to bringing that hype West Coast sound to the forefront. Really exciting, bro, in terms of uh, soundscape. It was really exciting, but all right, let's get into the review. You agree bro. with the great production? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but we, we had the same scores for this review, so like at the end of the day... So like, far, yeah. So far. Uh, but even for the replay value, I think we're going to have the same score for this one because we saw the runtime on this, and it was a big surprise, by the way, because there was never a track list that was announced, and you saw 12 songs, you saw 44 minutes, and like... Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're in for a ride. We are cooking here. Yeah, we are cooking. And you guys know how we are. We like short track lists. And maybe it's because my attention span is cooked, um, especially with everything that's coming out. But he got to the point with this one. You know, you can't fucking make this 20 songs. There was no way it was going to happen. And I think that that's really going to win points here as far as replay value goes. And there's always the conversation with Kendrick Lamar. Well, 
oh, you know, everyone praises his music and then it's kind of like in and out, you know, and like you're not going to revisit this. I'm going to be revisiting this album. There are songs on here that have a ton of replay value. There are songs on here that I want to go back to based on the writing. And Kendrick Lamar's music is timeless. Looking at GKMC and what it's been doing, you know, on the Hot 200, same thing with Damn, same thing, you know, with Mr. Morale, like, come on, like, you know, his music does stand the test of time and this album is going to be attached to a moment, but it's also not attached in a way because there's songs that feel separate um, from the battle and there's songs that I do value outside of it. So it depends. What are you taking? You know, what are you leaving? What's been the song that you've been junking the most over the weekend? What do you got? The song I've been playing the most? Squabble Up. Yeah, I've been going back Without to... Without a doubt, bro. I mean, come on. That song is a fucking total earworm. But um, that being said... I do want to say that, you know, when you going back to what you were saying about it being attached to a moment, I mean, I view it more as like it's going to be attached to this legendary 2024 year that he's had. Like this completed um, a historic run, one of the best MVP years in hip hop history. In my opinion, I really do put it on that level, even though this album won't be my number one album. I don't think it's the album of the year. I still think it, it is one of the stronger albums of 2024. And um, when it comes down to it, you know, I think he shut up a lot of the haters, a lot of the people that said, oh, well, he's just this socially conscious, you know, woke rapper who makes boring music. Like, sure, you can have that opinion if you want, if you're that ignorant and, and that dense. But if you really go into this track list, he proved that he can make bangers. And I think that's what's special about the way that I think this album was meant to be consumed is that it wasn't meant for you to be, you know, in your fucking bedroom with some beats on with a genius tab open with your notebook out fucking, you know, writing notes and layers that you're dissecting. No, this was meant to be bumped in low riders and in whips in Los Angeles on a beautiful summer's day with the fucking um, with the subwoofers going like that's the type of exactly. that's the type of album this is my little cousin has a subwoofers in the Mustang you better believe we're gonna be whipping this fuck yeah uh, but even at that if you want to get into your genius bag like if you want to be me and, if you want to be me and Lou and you want to be nerds you fuck can do it, it you could absolutely do it songs like well Man at the Garden was kind of like I get it you know like, that was a song I understood in the first concept because like I said in the content matter like it's it's very simple but yet there's so much deep messaging to it but if you want to go into the hard part six if you want to go into reincarnated you want to go into gloria you want to put those glasses on you want to nerd out fucking do it and there's no shame in doing it that's what this music shit is about that you know, that, you, that being said yeah. that being said um kendrick did say fuck a double entendre i want you all to feel this shit and that was the approach for the majority of the album, bro. He didn't try to make it too complex. This is like his most visceral album in the sense that he wants you to, to feel the emotions and feel the energy of the type of mood that he's in at this current moment. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely think that it's not meant to be looked into too deeply. Like, even some of the song concepts were easily understood upon first listen, whereas, like, in the past on albums like The Mimma Butterfly... It took so many listens to really fully peel back the layers. Well, even at that, if you're a Kendrick Lamar fan, this album is going to stand alone versus the rest of his albums because you have something that's a bit more accessible. You have something that is a bit simpler in approach and like that's going to create replay value as well because there's an album in the catalog now that stands alone from everything else. There's no concept to it. Well, there is a concept to it, but at the same time, it's not as um, tightly woven into as like a tip of a butterfly, even something like a section 80. That has an incredible concept to it. But all right, let's play the game, man. We do it. What are we keeping? What are we leaving? Man, I mean, let's see. Let's go through this again. Okay, Whacked Out Murals is keep. Like, that's an automatic absolutely keep. Absolutely. Squabble, Below. what a fucking banger, yeah, bro. Man at the Garden, I'm keeping that. Hold on. Luther, no? No, no, sir, for you? I would be lying to you guys if I said I was going to do it. I just want to be honest. I like, really, I really it, fuck it, with it. Like honestly it's not speaking, a song that I'm spinning. I'm being honest Like I said, there's parts of it that I don't fuck with, like, the drop it like it's hot or the, the, the fa, fa, fa. But as a song, I'm still, I'm vibing with it. Man at the Garden, um... I'm yes, keeping that, absolutely. Hey so, now, one hundred, one of my favorites. I love Hey now. I love Hey now. Reincarnated, keeping that. TV off. That's been my yes. most played song. Oh, Dodger this. Blue. I'm sorry. Like no, again, it. maybe it's because I'm not an LA native. It is definitely an LA tribute song. Maybe for that reason, it doesn't resonate with me like that. But again, just musically, I'm not fucking with Dodger Blue. Um, Peekaboo. Uh, eh. No, not really. Eh. The hard part six. I'm keeping. Yes. And then after that, Gloria. I'm keeping. GNX doesn't get uh, a keep for me. That's for sure. That's not okay, going to so be in rotation. Okay, so realistically, realistically, GNX, Peekaboo, um, and Luther, and Dodger Blue. So four skips. I have four, you have four total skips. Like you would skip them. All right. 
yeah, I'm going to be honest. Okay. Um, I would skip. Let me see here. Um, Dodger Blue for sure. Peekaboo GNX with three on my end. More than Out of the 12. Um, but yeah, man, let's get into our overall thoughts well, here. Well, the replay value. We're giving it an amazing rating. Oh, yeah. We didn't give the rating yet. Yeah, amazing for sure. Amazing. I mean, so concise. It's, it's the shortest album. It's so easy to consume. And I want to say this about the structure of the album that was really well done in terms of curation. If you go through the track list and you look at the way that he ordered these songs, when you look at, let's say, Man at the Garden, then Hey Now. It's introspective, then more upbeat, high-energy banger. Reincarnated, TV off. Um, Dodger Blue, Peekaboo. Hard Part 6, GNX. Then going into from GNX to Gloria, he had an amazing balance of Again, high tempo songs that are very in your face and raw to something a bit more introspective and deep. So great an intro and outro as well. The sequencing on the album was super well done. That's gonna add points for the replay value. But all right, let's do it. Overall thoughts. It was time. This was inevitable. This was genuinely inevitable. And I remember we put out the post of Apple Music claiming that Kendrick Lamar um, was the MVP for 2024. And um, there was full of quote retweets of people saying, well, maybe it should have been Future. Maybe it should have been this. Realistically, he didn't put an album out. What do you know? A couple of days after, boom, you get a studio album on your lap. I like that this didn't have too much promotion behind it as far as a rollout goes before it. It was a surprise album. That's always appreciated. Um, when you look at this track list, there's so many different types of sounds that you could get into. But as you said, um, you're getting this West Coast production that's prominent and this West Coast approach that is prominent within the entire track list. You're getting bangers on here. You're getting great song concepts. Um, it's Kendrick Lamar's most accessible album as far as like writing goes. Um, it's not necessarily too hard of an album to analyze. So maybe there's going to be new fans that are generated off of this album and they're going to want to get into it. So... When I look at this album, I want to give it an amazing rating, and that's what the scores add up to. Um, listen, man, yeah, I think when looking at, like, GNX, right? This is this car from the 80s, an 87 Buick Grand National. That you know what's a fun fact about this Grand National, yeah. by the way? Um, they put up this car against the Ferrari Testa Rosa back then, and this thing, like, it won, bro. And it had, like, my dad, because my dad was telling me, he's like, do you know what a GNX is? And I'm like, no, and it was one of my uncles, like, grails for a car as well, and he's like, this is really like a classic I, I, American I, uh, muscle. I saw a post about, I think it was a GNX S, and I think it has like 1,500 horses, like just a fucking machine of a car. But yeah, that being said, this is the car that Kendrick always dreamed about having as a kid. And on this album, he's celebrating rapping that, you know, he's riding around in this car listening to some Anita Baker, which, by the way, is a reference to an old black hippie song. But that being said, this is kind of the way that I looked at the way that he was celebrating having this GNX finally is that it's truly a metaphor for him growing up into the game, always wanting to be a rap legend, and now him finally feeling like he's lived up to that. I feel like the GNX is his prize for the, from this whole situation. You know what, though? I wish he would have went with different branding because I really want a Grand National, and it's like it's a grill car for me as well. And uh, if it wasn't hard to get them before, forget about it. Even ju Not even the GNX, even just like a Grand National. Like, it's so hard to pick them up. So, yeah, fuck, you better believe the market's going to get fucking low on these bad boys. But, yeah, no, I, I definitely feel like the, the GNX is his trophy for winning the battle and just for where he's reached, the heights he's reached in his career. Um, listen, bro, this is the exact the album that I, I wanted, bro. This is exactly what I wanted from Kendrick Lamar. If you guys are paying attention to some of the videos we did before this album came out, I literally said I wanted a victory lap album where you got, you know, high energy bangers where it was looser, it wasn't super conceptual, and that's exactly what he delivered. I will say this. I think this is, the way it stands right now, Kendrick Lamar's weakest album, and it's not because there isn't a grand conceptual, you know, masterpiece at play. I think it's because... If you do really look at it, you're not getting his finest bar work. Um, he's experimenting with a lot of performances. He's being a bit more reckless, and he's having fun. And sometimes it works to his benefit. So um, ultimately, to me, it didn't feel like Kendrick Lamar necessarily evolved his craft with that with that with this album, and that's totally okay, bro. Again, the the idea with with this was to give a snapshot of where he's at right now in his life, and. I don't think it was meant to be a game-changing album. I feel well, like... Hold on. Let, let me just finish my thought. I feel like this is a warm-up. I feel like this is going to be a mixtape that leads into that next masterpiece. And those theories about an album maybe coming next year, I believe them. You think so? I believe them. 
it would be nice to see him drop more frequently because it's always an event when it happens. But, you know, to your statement about him not necessarily having too much of an evolution, um, this is the first time he really approached this type of production. Um, the, the song concepts are motivated by a whole battle that went on. Like, this is technically a new approach for Kendrick Lamar. It's just more simple. He's always someone that's pushed his pen to the highest degrees and has always made these conceptual masterpieces. But No, I, no, this, I know, but what I'm trying to tell you is that... I, I want to finish my statement like I gave you yours. Um, I will say this, like the idea of him um, kind of you know, getting a bit more laid back with the album and him, you know, kind of, like you said, proving the doubters wrong. I think that's a challenge in itself. Sometimes it's hard um, for conceptual rappers and guys that really, you know, approach these albums with a bit more prowess um, to get, you know, a bit more laid back with it. So I think he did accomplish something with this album and I think that he did push himself. Oh, I never say he didn't accomplish something with this album. I'm just saying that when you look at it in terms of different individual like skill sets, I feel like Kendrick didn't necessarily show us something that we didn't know he was capable of doing before. And like I said, that's totally okay. That's this is me. a detour of an album. And again, it's an album unlike anything else in his discography. And that's why I appreciate it so much is that it was about time he dropped an album where he's just, he's having fun. He's celebrating and he's basking in the moment. So ultimately, this is an amazing album. And it's something that will be remembered in history without a doubt just because of the year that it's been attached to. But guys, that's how we feel about the album. Let us know in the comment section how would you score this album based on excuse me based on our scales we would love to know and let us know which album do you guys want to see us review next and just a little reminder as you could see ant was rocking the nfr t-shirt from our merch collection it is still up right now if you guys do want to support the drop and thank you so much guys for the wonderful support not only in the content but also on the merch collection we love you guys we thank you and we'll see you next time peace out